Hi there. So, indie games are great. Her Story, Obradin, these games aren't constrained to fit into the traditional standards of how games should look or play. And in late 2017, an indie game was released which took the world by storm. Cuphead. This fiendishly difficult run-and-gun platformer captured our hearts with its gorgeous 1930s art style, jazz soundtrack, and incredible-looking bosses. And now, with a Switch version just around the corner, I figured we could take a look at how this title came to be as we journey through Cuphead's development history. Our story starts with brothers Chad and Jared Moldenhauer. From an early age, they had an interest in video games, and more specifically, what made them tick. They played all sorts of games, but a favourite genre of the two was run-and-gun games. Games like Contra, for example. Now, after finishing a particular game together, the brothers would discuss amongst themselves. It would have been better if it was like this instead, and so on. From here sprung forth their ambitions of one day developing a game of their own together. Now, as the two began growing older, they started trying out some smaller game development projects. Chad, for example, put together a simple game titled Grandma Pickens, where you play as a grandma picking berries. If you pick enough berries, you can make jams, custards, or even a fresh tort. Now, in the year 2000, the two noticed that Microsoft were running an indie game development program for the Xbox, so they built a PC to match the exact specifications of the computers Microsoft were sending out to developers. They started trying out a few possible ideas, and right away the idea of developing a run-and-gun style game like the ones they had played as children stood out to them. Their first plan was a game inspired by the classic title Contra, called Omega Response, but this didn't end up working out. Next, they tried out a game they called Ninja Stars, which had two main characters drawn in crayon, one red and one blue. However, due to technical problems, the two ended up giving up on developing a game for the Xbox, so they returned to their jobs in construction and web design. But in 2010, the two noticed something. Indie games like Super Meat Boy were taking off big time. Was it time to finally develop their dream game? Two years later, near the end of 2012, they decided to give it a shot. From the start, they knew they were going to stick with their run-and-gun idea. But what about the specifics? Well, when thinking back to the games from their childhood, the parts that stood out most strongly in their minds were the thrilling, captivating boss battles. Bosses often seemingly went on forever, with many unique and bizarre iterations and an absolutely brutal level of difficulty. They decided to theme their game around these boss battles. Now, although they had ambitions of huge, sprawling adventures with a mixture of platforming levels and boss battles, they knew that with the level of funding they had, practically nothing, they would have to scale back their plans a little. They settled on having eight grand boss battles. This way, they would be able to, well, develop the game. That's always a good thing. But what about the game's art style? Well, the first thing the two had in mind was an elementary school. The different levels would be themed around different years. You would start in kindergarten dodging handprint turkey enemies, then gradually work your way up through the school into the older years with more complex level themes. Alright, the game's concept had finally been nailed down. However, one day Chad and Jared were messing around, and as a joke, replaced the art for a few of the characters with cutouts of characters from old Disney animated films. They added a little animation, and then showed this to their friends. But, rather than laughing, the friends reacted with extreme excitement, urging the brothers that they had to use this art style instead. It would make the game stand out, and it just looked so cool. Upon hearing this, Chad started crying. Using this art style would take an unbelievable amount of time and effort. Heck, he had never done any proper animation before in his life. But he sadly knew his friends were right. This art style was so much better. Resignedly, the two gave in and made the decision to switch over to a 1930s cartoon style. A huge amount of research was needed. Chad studied animator Richard Williams's instructional book, The Animator's Survival Kit, for the next six months. Plus, the two poured over the VHS tapes they had from their childhood of classic 30s cartoons from Disney and Max Fleischer, among others. They stepped through each frame, examining how the line thicknesses varied and how the objects morphed into different forms. Eventually, they decided that they were ready to begin, and so development of the Brothers game began in earnest. 
Now, before starting on any of the art or bosses, the two Moldenhauers knew that they had to nail down the gameplay, specifically the movement of the main character. For now, they used a little weird green guy as a placeholder, their words not mine, and messed around with the speed of the jumping, the feel of the movement, the timing of the buttons. They kept tweaking all of this until the gameplay felt smooth and satisfying. Once they figured out the main character's movement, they realised that they needed to replace the green guy with an actual main character. But what would they look like? Well, they started digging through their old 30s cartoon VHS tapes, looking for inspiration. At first, they had the idea of a green Kappa-like character, who they added a top hat to later. However, they then stumbled across this Stilly Symphonies cartoon, where the world came to life, a sort of precursor to Toy Story, if you will. Well, when they saw this, Chad and Jared changed tack, planning a character with a plate for a head, and then one for a fork with a head. Hmm, it still wasn't quite coming together. It was then that they found this 1936 Japanese propaganda film featuring an evil version of Mickey Mouse attacking Japan. And if you look closely, there, that guy there, that was the final push the two needed. When they saw this odd looking character, Chad and Jared thought to themselves, let's try that. And after drawing a couple of versions, it had already stuck. Now, around this time, Chad and Jared were joined by another team member, Maya Moldenhauer, Chad's wife. At first, she started helping out on the art. However, as development progressed, she noticed how lax the two tended to be about deadlines, and said to herself, no, I have to take the reins here. And so, she pivoted to a more managerial role on the production side of things, where she was responsible for checking whether development was progressing smoothly and if deadlines were being met. And so, in October of 2013, the three developers put together a quick trailer for their game, which they hoped might catch some people's attentions. Well, it didn't get seen by very many people, but it was seen by someone very important, Microsoft, specifically their ID at Xbox team, who were responsible for overseeing indie game development on the Xbox platform. Now, this team saw promise in the trio's project and offered to form a partnership between the two companies. They didn't offer a whole load of money, I mean, they offered some, of course, but nothing mind-blowing. But crucially, they offered to help the trio in the area where they needed it the most, marketing. You see, when the two teams met up, Maya Moldenhauer admitted that the team had no PR plan whatsoever, and so the Microsoft team responded, great, let us help you. In return, Cuphead would become an exclusive game for the Xbox and PC, until a few years later, at least. And when E3 2014 rolled around, Microsoft put a brief, four-second preview of their game into the middle of their presentation. People's response? Delight! They couldn't wait to get their hands on this weird, 30s-looking game. Hmm. If people were so enthusiastic about the title, perhaps the Moldenhauers could expand the scope just a little. They were still pretty cautious, though. Money was tight. So they decided to hire three more developers, forming a cosy team of six people. They planned to add four or five extra bosses, bringing the count up to 12 or 13. And as E3 2015 began growing nearer, Microsoft decided to gamble on the Cuphead developers, and feature them and their game prominently in their upcoming presentation. See look, there they are on stage. And fairly unsurprisingly, this increased people's interest in the game massively. People were ravenous. Seeing this, Chad and Jared knew they had to go all out and truly develop their dream game. They massively increased the game's scope and added far more boss battles, plus a number of regular run and gun battles to break up the game a little. To do this, they hired a bunch more people, bringing their team up to 16. To do that, the two quit their jobs and remortgaged their homes. Not an easy decision to make, but this would allow them to finally expand the game's scope to what they had originally dreamed of all the way back in 2012. And so, after having pushed back the release date a number of times already, the developers decided that 2017 was going to be the year that Cuphead was released. However, getting the game ready to launch on their own would be pretty difficult, and so Studio MDHR decided to partner with Montreal-based company Illogica. They had previously assisted on development of mobile games Hitman Go and Lara Croft Go with Square Enix, and according to Maya Moldenhauer, they proved to be lifesavers, helping with development, testing, and support. And so, on the 29th of December 2017, Cuphead was released. Instantly, it was clear that the game was a hit. 
Reviews were outstanding, praising the game's 1930s aesthetic and jazz soundtrack, and describing the difficulty as high but not at all unfair. Sales were orders of magnitude greater than Studio MDHR had expected. Up until then, they had mostly thought of it as a niche title, but 3 million copies certainly ain't niche. And in a 2019 Nindies Direct, it was announced that the title would be arriving on the Nintendo Switch on April 18th, in spite of it previously being an Xbox and PC exclusive. The jury's still out about what exactly Microsoft have to gain from putting it on the Switch, but hey, I'm not complaining. Now I can be frustrated both at home and on the go. Hi there, thanks for watching to the end. So Cuphead for Switch is coming out in a few days, I've got it pre-ordered, but I'm a bit worried about how I'll do. I'm very bad at hard games, but I'll give it a shot. Wish me luck. Okay, that's all. See you soon. Bye.